The story of Custian Barracks can be said to begin with the ending of a war. In 1691, Ireland was a significant theatre in a wider European conflict and, for three years, there had been fighting between the Jacobite army, mostly composed of Irish Catholics loyal to King James II, and the Williamite army, a multinational force fighting for William of Orange. After the Battle of the Boyne in 1690, the Williamites had besieged that loan but had been repulsed by a Jacobite army in which Colonel Richard Grace had played a decisive part. In 1691, however, the Williamite army returned to Atlone determined to take the town, a feat they achieved after a great battle. After capturing Atlone, the Williamite army won a victory at Ockram, taking Galway and Limerick soon after. The Treaty of Limerick of October 1691 led to the disbandment of the Jacobite army and what became known as the Flight of the Wild Geese, as Irish leaders such as Patrick Sarsfield, along with soldiers and their families, left Ireland. A new phase in the history of the country had begun, and it was also a new phase in the history of Athlone. Its position in the centre of Ireland, on the border between Leinster and Connacht, made it a strategically important hub for communications and logistics. The conquering Williamite army fortified the town as a base for their future operations, housing a few regiments of troops in a series of wooden huts on the west side of the river, on the grounds of what would become Custom Barracks. It is from this time that the modern barracks can trace its beginnings. Athlone was then, and would remain for over 200 years, a garrison town for the British Army. Yet the garrison in Athlone remained small throughout the 1700s, comprising a few units of cavalry and a handful of infantry companies. During the closing decades of the century and into the 1800s, Britain became obsessed with the threat of revolutionary France and the rise to power of Napoleon Bonaparte. The British were well aware that Athlone would be a prized possession in the event of a French invasion, and the barracks was greatly expanded between 1784 and 1815. In tandem with the growth of the barracks, Athlone Castle was also redeveloped during the early 19th century, with the work completed by around 1827. It was during that period that a massive series of artillery emplacements were built on the west side of the Shannon. Those guns, known as the batteries, formed part of a vast defensive structure linked by sunken pathways, of which only fragments now remain. The building works initiated in the 1790s had transformed the barracks into an impressive complex of buildings, a fact that was related by the Reverend Ansley Strain, who, in 1819, compiled a report on the locality. Here there is a large barrack, furnishing accommodation for 2,000 troops, to which belong two magazines, an armoury calculated to hold 15,000, stand of arms, and very extensive military stores forming a general depot for which to supply other garrisons of the kingdom. These are all within the presence of the barrack, together with an ordnance yard, wherein are constantly employed the several artificers necessary for making all the iron and timber works of gun carriages and other military engines. And within the same precincts are two hospitals in one building, in a separate yard, and one artillery hospital in the barrack yard. But what was the relationship between this barracks and the wider locality? One problem we encounter when we attempt to reconstruct the past is that the voices of the powerful and the wealthy are often all that remain. We have the memoirs of officers and the recollections of wealthy travellers who toured through the locality. We have the official reports of the ruling establishment, all cold statistics and seeding prejudices, and we have the news as reported in the press. But, amid the cacophony, We hear little from the common soldiers and practically nothing from the women and children whose lives centred around the barracks. What glimpses we can gain of those lives show that they lived in harsh and unforgiving times. It seems that many of those destitute women, whose soldiers were dead or stationed abroad, were forced to provide for themselves and their children through prostitution. In his report in Athlone, Reverend Strain stated that prostitution was so common that it could be seen in all the streets as well as the hedges and ditches about the town. Strain also described a multitude of destitute people who crowded around the military garrison. There are beggars from every county in Ireland, and even from England and Scotland. Athlone, being the great pass between Leinster and Connaught, brings thither many settlers of that description, and a number of soldiers' wives and their children, who are left by their husbands when ordered on foreign service, as well as the widows of those who die in the garrison, served to render that class of the community still more numerous. The existence of the barracks created a thriving trade in the sale of sex, and it also helped to create a marketplace in the saving of souls, by providing an active congregation for various churches. The Reverend John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, 
is known to have preached in the riding school in the barracks during a visit to Etlone, and the religious influence of soldiers of various faiths and nationalities was manifested in the buildings of the town, as can be heard in this account from a Scottish soldier who served in Ireland during the late 1790s and early 1800s. We did not return to the Wicklow Mountains, but encamped during the autumn at Moat, and when winter set in, we went into Athlone for winter quarters. We lay there from the end of October 1798 to June 1799. In this place, it pleased God to lead my mind to serious and deep reflection, and to begin a work of sharp conviction, such as I had never experienced before. There was a Catholic chapel, an English church, and a Wesleyan Methodist meeting house in the town. In the Methodist meeting house, there were always public prayers, evening and morning, and sermon on the Lord's Day, and often twice a week in the evenings. I attended the meeting house pretty closely and began to read my Bible with more than common attention. Displays of devotion may have been common, but so were displays of cruelty. The barracks itself was seemingly not a healthy nor a happy place, especially during the 1700s and the first half of the 1800s. Contemporary newspapers record many instances of widespread illness and of violence, including murder, carried out by soldiers and officers both within the barracks and against members of the public. The soldiers themselves faced severe, sometimes grotesque punishments for their infractions, especially in cases of desertion, as can be seen in a report from the Freeman's Journal newspaper in 1794, detailing the treatment of a soldier named Fay, a deserter from the 18th Light Dragoons. He was tried by court-martial and sentenced to 1,000 lashes, 600 of which he received yesterday in the presence of a number of spectators. In a few days he is to receive 400 more, the remainder, and then to be drummed out of the regiment. He bore his punishment with hardened resolution, yet at some intervals entreated that he might be shot. He did not receive the whole of those lashes on the back. Some were given to him on another part, where he appeared to have more feeling. But, for all his sufferings, there appeared to be no pity among those who beheld his castigation. While such cases show us life within the barracks, it is hard to discern the attitudes of the general public towards the garrison during this period. Soldiers from the barracks participated in evictions at various times during the 19th century, a cause of local resentment. But the barracks became an increasingly important part of the local economy during the 19th century, especially from the 1850s when the barracks underwent further development due to the arrival of the railway to Etlone. A portion of the barracks was turned into a public routeway, later named Grace Road, linking the railway station to the town, and it was at this time that the water gate was added to the barracks, giving its soldiers access to the Shannon. Those changes transformed both the barracks and the town, and over the next 50 years, the barracks became more integrated into the locality. Yet while the barracks played a role sometimes formative in various social activities, particularly in sports and music, its primary role remained as a garrison and recruitment centre for the British Army. Many locals who joined the British Army in Athlone would later serve across the British Empire, especially in India. Consider the words of William Megan, who grew up near Athlone in the early 20th century and who was later a leading figure in British military intelligence during the Cold War. He judged that the presence of a large military garrison and its strong connections to exotic and far-flung locations had a profound effect on the local population, especially men of military age who saw in the barracks an opportunity to travel, in a literal sense, but also in the sense of career development. As Megan recalled in his memoir An Irish Boyhood, in such a British garrison town as at Lone, he wrote, it would have been impossible to escape the influence of India. Those were the great days of the empire, of which India was the greatest part, and there were many in the garrison and in the vicinity of Athlone who served there. The Connacht Rangers, for example, spent long periods stationed in India throughout the 19th century, and many men from Athlone and the surrounding region served with the regiment. It must be noted that, in so doing, they were joining an army whose primary purpose was the defence of British hegemony. This involved the regular suppression of revolts against, and challenges to, British power. A number of Athlone soldiers, including some who served in Athlone barracks, played a wholehearted role in such dark episodes as the British Army's brutal response to the Indian Rebellion of 1857 and 1858. 
The soldiers stationed in Athlone Barracks, named Victoria Barracks during the 19th century, were also deployed in Ireland. Late 19th century newspapers contain reports of the garrison aiding the police and conducting evictions and in official attempts to disrupt the activities of the Land League. Yet, by the 1900s, the barracks was an integral part of the town. The empire, of which it was a cog and on which the sun supposedly never set, seemed destined to last long into the future. But Irish history, and the history of the British Empire, would be irrevocably changed by the cataclysm into which the great powers dragged the world in 1914.